Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get into that, I have to thank you for coming from all over the world to watch my videos and for making the nicest comments about me. I really do appreciate it. I'm very thankful for it. And I'm humbled by it. So thank you very much. The first thing I have today is a video from Prager University. This is about the conflict in Israel. And I have it queued up to the part that I want you to hear. And they were happy. When you walk through Kafar Aza, it's just, it's like you can still smell the gunpowder and the residue and you can feel the pain in that community. You know, to this day, I just feel like my words will never do justice to what happened there. And knowing that Kafar Aza was a largely young community where people were just starting out their lives. You had engaged couples who were slaughtered in their homes. You see their blood all over the wall. You know the stories of them being burned alive, of babies being put into ovens. It's just evil. That's all I can really say about it. So right now we're just a few minutes away from Gaza, about one and a half miles. So just for protection, you know, this is a safe area, but we still need our bulletproof vests so that we're just extra protected. A lot of people are gonna be wearing helmets as well, uh, just for all safety protocols. I'm hearing so many bombs, so many reactions of Israel retaliating to Gaza and Hamas's attacks, our attacks. So right now it's just better to be safe than sorry. see the doorknobs that are ripped off the handles. You can see where the explosions were. You can see bullet holes everywhere. The fact that these monsters just went in and kidnapped these kids and dragged them over to Gaza and for what? And like, what is the reason? Simply because you don't want Jewish people to exist. Like how deep can your hatred possibly be for someone to cause this kind of chaos and devastation? People keep calling for a ceasefire, but these people still haven't even been returned home. There are still so many people, children even, who are over in Gaza right now being held hostage, who have done nothing wrong. All they've done is try to exist in peace, and this is the treatment that they're receiving. They didn't discriminate who they murdered. They didn't discriminate the kind of chaos they were causing. These people, they want to take out Jews. They want to take out Christians. They want to take out the Arabs who live peacefully here in Israel. They just don't want Israel to exist. It's the only country that is constantly fighting simply for the right to exist. And people keep asking me why I'm being so outspoken about this issue because I'm not Jewish. I'm not Israeli. I'm just somebody with eyes. And I see the horror that's been caused here. And there is nothing that could possibly justify what I'm witnessing right now. And I will continue to stand in solidarity with Israel because this just is not, this isn't right. And you. I wanted you to hear that because I think it's important for us to remember that there really is no justification for what Hamas did. Yes, there are humanitarian concerns in Palestine, and we need to be cognizant of those, and we need to be concerned about them. We need to be doing what we can to help those people. But what Hamas did is inexcusable. There is no rationale, no, no sensible, sane rationale that can justify what they did. If they attacked soldiers, that would be different, but they didn't. They attacked civilians. And their entire purpose for everything they did was simply to kill Jews. That's what they wanted to do. And we need to keep that in mind when the, when the, uh, as the war drags on and people demand more and more for ceasefires and all this kind of stuff, we need to remember why the, this war was started. Oh. The second thing that I have today is the collapse in law enforcement. As arrest rates plummet, people have been less willing to report crimes. This is a research paper that's written by John Lott. If you're not familiar with John Lott, he's an economist. He does a lot of work on uh, crime and gun safety and those kinds of issues. And uh, people have criticized him for his work because they don't like the results that he's getting, but they have not been able to prove that the research that he's done is incorrect. They'll say it is, but they can't prove it. So he wrote this article because there's something interesting going on, and I want to read it to you just briefly. 
Uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to read one, uh, one report from one news agency. Murder plummeted in the United States in 2023 at one of the fastest rates of decline ever recorded, Asher found, and every category of major crime except auto theft declined. Yet, <laughs> and this is the interesting part, Yet, 92% of Republicans, 78% of Independents, and 58% of Democrats believe crime is rising, the Gallup survey shows. Yeah, the reason they believe it is because it is. People aren't stupid. You can try to feed us this baloney about how crime is going down, and the news agencies are trying to pump it out there. I mean, they're... they're broadcasting it constantly. Crime is going down. Crime is going down. Crime. No, it's not. And they know it's not, but they're lying. And they're lying because they want you to reelect Biden or because they want you to believe that reality isn't reality. I don't know what their reasons are, but come on. Now, this is the part I want to read to you from his research. But there is a big problem with using the FBI uniform crime report data on crimes reported to police because victims don't report most crimes. More importantly, the number of crimes reported to police falls as the arrest rate declines. If people don't think the police will solve their case, they're less likely to report them to the police. That just makes sense, right? While the violent crime rate reported to police fell by 1.7% between 2021 and 2022, the National Crime Victimization Survey shows that total incidents of crime, total violent crime, reported and non-reported, rose from 16.5 to 23.5 per 100,000. Violent crime in 2022 was above the rate of last year before the pandemic in 2019 and above the average for the five years from 2015 to 2019. And if you look at his graph above, the red line is the 2024 or 2023, excuse me, 2023 uh, arrest rates for crime. As you can see, Arrest rates have been dropping over the past couple of years. And that lines up perfectly with all of the stuff that's going on with electing what they call Soros prosecutors. These are the people that don't punish crime and they want no bail. They want to release people on their own recognizance. And they're, they're just, they're not even enforcing the law that they're sworn to enforce. So. Obviously, I'll put the link in the description for you so that you can read the article if you're interested. The next one is, Brazil is on the brink of dictatorship. Elon Musk, Elon Musk, is resisting the government's demand for censorship. Now, this is an interesting article because what you find out when you read it is that all of the other social media companies have caved in. And they are handing over to the Brazilian government the personal information of their subscribers and their private messages and everything. They're just handing it over. They don't even expect, they don't even ask for a subpoena. They just hand it over. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. And then finally, I have another Tucker Carlson interview this one I want you to see because it's really interesting. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't, I don't often believe people who are quote, quote, pre uh, predicting the future. I just don't. Uh, the, far too many times they're wrong. And they're proven wrong when the future arrives and their predictions didn't come true. But the comments this guy is making are based on his personal knowledge. And they're kind of interesting. And it's something positive for once. So I thought, well, 
The I news is TV. so grim at this point that you almost don't want to turn on your phone in the morning. It's just peace after unremitting peace, suggesting that Western civilization is crumbling and collapsing all around us, followed by typically a summary piece confirming that, in fact, it is collapsing all around us. Yeah. So it is against that grim landscape that we read a piece the other day that was just the opposite. It was hopeful and smart and beautifully expressed. And a couple of people sent it to us. It was written by a man called Santiago Pliego, and it's written on a substack. and the piece is called The Vibe Shift. And the thesis essentially is that people are starting to notice that things are amiss. And the main thing that's amiss is the gap between the reality that they observe and the version of reality presented them by the government, the media, the experts. And this is good. It is long overdue that people are starting to see glimpses of reality. Uh, here's a paragraph from the piece that kind of sums up the idea very nicely, and we're quoting. The vibe shift I'm talking about is the speaking of previously unspeakable truths, the noticing of previously suppressed facts. I'm talking about the feel you get when the walls of propaganda and bureaucracy start to move as you push. The very visible dust kicked up in the air as experts and fact checkers scramble to hold on to decaying institutions. The cautious but electric rush of energy when dictatorial edifices designed to stifle innovation, enterprise and thought are exposed or toppled. As we said, so nicely expressed, beautifully written. Santiago Pliego is the venture director at New Founding and we're honored to have him join us now. Santiago, thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing this piece, which absolutely made my morning. Um, and it really was the one, the one bright spot in my uh, news consumption last week. Why did you write this piece? What moved you to do it? Sure, thanks for having me. Why I wrote it is because I think um, a lot of people are noticing the vibe shift and I'd been kind of keeping tabs on it with my friends and my colleagues for, you know, let's say nine months or so, a little bit over that, but especially in the last nine months, not a day goes by that we uh, don't have a conversation where, or see something online or read a piece or see a crossover of people that we would have never expected to see kind of together. Um, and uh, that, that would have been sort of inconceivable five years ago, even a year and a half ago. And uh, my friends and I sort of started to file this away in a mental folder called the Vive Shift. And I think a lot of people are, are sensing that things are changing. Sure, the stakes are, are high and getting higher. I think the pressure will continue to come um, and will not relent. But that's cost a lot of people, especially young people, young guys especially, to kind of wake up and decide that they're not going to go along with this anymore, that the world is built and designed in a certain way, and that they're ready to return to reality. You said that people are coming together in unexpected ways. I see that in my own life as I send warm texts to Naomi Wolf, who I love. I never thought I'd be doing that uh, in this lifetime. But t tell us what you mean when you say that. Yeah, so there are there's a pressure that is applied equally to groups of people, regardless of sort of the camp or the community you might be uh, a part of. If you are a normal family, you just want you to send your kids to a school where they won't get fed, you know, ideology. Or if you're building AI tools and don't want them to be regulated. Or if you just want to be able to speak your mind. Or if you want to be able to vote uh, without interference or whatever. All of those people, uh, are now facing the same pressure to kind of decelerate, stagnate, to ossify into a bureaucratic monolith. And so I think these groups, what's interesting about the vibe shift, one of the interesting things about the vibe shift is that all of these groups that were um, usually not used to working together or seeing each other as co-belligerents in a cultural fight are finding each other and are saying, hey, you have useful things that, that we can use over here, and, and we have useful things and thoughts and ideas that you can use over here. And that's creating again, the, this pressure, this monolithic pressure, uh, bureaucratic pressure, top down across a variety of different groups and circles, whether you're in Silicon Valley or just a normal American family or in the Midwest or in, it doesn't matter. Everybody is facing this kind of existential pressure. And that's causing a lot of these groups to look for co belligerents, to look for allies. And that's creating really interesting crossovers. Uh, people that you would not think uh, would be working together or reading each other or 
boosting each other's content or, or uh, interacting with one another are all of a sudden coming together in ways that, uh, that are exciting. So I'll put the link in the description and you can watch the whole thing. But um, later on in the interview, he talks about, and, and I get the impression, although he never said it, that, or maybe he said it and I didn't catch it, but that he is a uh, venture capitalist. And so he talks about how he's encountering more and more young men who are coming up with really exciting ideas for businesses that are completely out of the mainstream. And the, repeatedly he's seeing these young men who are saying, no, I'm not going to comply with your demands. And so when I watched this, it gave me some hope that maybe maybe things are starting to turn around. Maybe human beings, we, we creatures, have had enough of the bureaucrats and the elites telling us what to do. And there's an, there's an undercurrent, if you will, uh, of discontent and an undercurrent of revolution not violent revolution but a revolution where people just say no i will not comply anymore and if that's true if that's true and i'm saying if because i don't know we you know it's impossible to predict the future but if that's true if what he's saying is true that he's seeing this undercurrent then maybe there is hope for our future after all and that to me is exciting and so i thought i would share it with you so that's the news for today. I pray that you will live an abundant life, that you'll be healthy and that you'll live a long time and that God will keep you safe from harm. I pray that he'll do that, the same thing, all of that, abundant life, health, long life, and keeping you safe for every single person that you love. And I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.